to another episode of Paranormal, The New Normal. I'm your host, as always, Jeremy, here trying to make the world a little more normal, but these days, that's just damn near impossible. And today, man, it's not going to happen today either, because we're talking about a w- worlds of, well, worlds of semi-fiction, actually, so maybe it is possible, but let me, t- let me introduce the guest today who's going to help me with this process, as always. And my guest today is Damon Manx, author and paranormal experiencer. How you doing tonight, Damon? I'm very well. Thank you for having me tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure. But let me ask you this. What got you into the paranormal slash supernatural world? You know, I've always been interested in the unknown um, since I was a, the youngest. The, the, from my very first experience, probably seeing the first Halloween movie, I was enwrapped in, in with that whole mystic experience of Halloween. I remember reading uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes and watching the old Twilight Zone episodes. And, you know, that just captured me. Then as I got, you know, a little bit older, a couple strange things happened to me that really made me wonder, you know, do I know really what what's going on in this world? You know, I, clearly there are things I can't explain and to this day, I still can't explain. And it it uh, inspired me so much that I wanted to become a, a horror author and write speculative fiction and about the unknown possibilities of what's out there lurking in the shadows. Oof, I like the way you put that. And that's why you're an author, not not. Because <laughs> I, could, <laughs> I, could, I could even write that line. Of, oh, maybe I could, but it would take time. But uh, that's... That's a that's a great way to put it. It really is. Which kind of leads into the second question I ask everybody: What experiences did you have personally that led you down this road? Well, if any, um, I've had a couple, and ne- neither one of them is a short answer. So, at the risk of uh, taking up a lot of your time, I guess I I'll start off with the first one. All right. So I was about ten years old. Um, You know, and back in those days, you you had to be home when the sun went down and the streetlights came on. So I'm riding my bike through the neighborhood and, you know, it it was a wooded area. We not a lot of houses were built back then, but there was one across the street in a very um, secluded piece of property. And there were three girls who lived there and they were all a little bit older than me. Um, And. Being about 10 myself, you know, they were 13 and 14 and 15. And, you know, uh, of course, I was very interested in what those girls were doing all the time. Um, So I was riding the bike home and I get to right about in front of my house and I heard them. They called me. They said, Damon, Damon, what are you doing? And I stop and they're running across the lawn and in these long flowing nightgowns and the sun is just about to set and the shadows are creeping in and you could hear the uh the crickets and the frogs and and all those woodland creatures making their noise before it's uh just about to get dark and they say come over here so i put the bike down by the side of the road and i walked over to where they were and they spread out a blanket and then one of the girls fiona pulls out a Ouija board. I had never seen one before. And I, I looked at it and I'm like, what's an algebra board? You know, they said that that's a Ouija board. Um, it, it lets you communicate with the spirits. I did not believe that. So we all sat around in a circle and they start playing with this thing. And I'm watching the planchette move across the board. And I'm certain that they're doing it. And then they ask me to put my fingers on it while Samantha, the oldest sister, puts her fingers on the other side. And they start asking these questions and the questions start getting darker and darker. And then finally they ask, when is Damon going to die? And I feel this thing move like, and I'm, her fingers are like coming off it. And this thing moves across the board and it goes to four zero. Now I'm much older than 40 right now, 
But I lived the rest of my days forever in fear of that coming 40th birthday, that it would be the day that I would die. But on very close to my 40th birthday, I was involved in a very serious accident. And Hmm. I was injured. And I became addicted to painkillers from that accident. And that led to a very serious downfall in my life for quite a few years. So I, I think a part of me did die when I was 40. And I think that was a paranormal premonition that I did not take heed to the warning. I've gone on to write a book about that experience um, called Piece by Piece. And although your listeners probably won't hear it, it's available for free today on Amazon in the ebook. So if you want to pick up a copy, you could go over there and get it. Um, it's it's free all over the world today, piece by piece by Damon Manx. Uh, it's it's a similar story about somebody who's told when they're going to die. Unfortunately, their story ends a little differently than mine. That was the first experience. I'll tell you about the second, but we might need a little breath in between. There's, there's that's yeah. an even longer one. Well, let me say this. I mean, I am a huge believer in premonition because I have had premoni- pre- uh, premonition like dreams my whole life. They never be they never amounted to anything worthwhile. It was always just this conversation is going to happen this day in this room with these people, and then months down the road that will happen. But it's not it's never anything life changing or big decision making like type thing it's just stupid little conversations that make no difference in the world whatsoever but so i mean i kind of tapped into that world but i just it never amounts to like me winning the lottery or me saving someone's life or something like that you know right <laughs> if, if only yeah um you know so i'll uh, there, there's actually a little snippet of, of one that happened to me that touches base on that. And it was after I had been married and it was very early in the morning. We were still asleep and I was dreaming that the phone was ringing. And the only person that I could have figured it could have been was my mother. So I woke up out of the dream, called my mom and I said, what happened? And I woke her up. She's like, what are you talking about? Nothing happened. Um, so, uh, you know, she, we hung up, figured I just had a bad dream. About 15 minutes later, she calls me back and says, what is going on? She's like, your aunt just called. Your Uncle Joe just passed away. Um, that was crazy. That was really crazy. So, Sounds so, crazy. I mean. Yeah. And that type of stuff happens all the time, too. I mean, you are not the first person to tell me a story like that where it's something similar where they sense that someone else in the family was was about to befall something horrible and like they just sensed it like different ways whether it be a dream or whether they just had a feeling like i don't know but it's just crazy yeah. i mean it, it's yeah crazy. The, there's there's some other vibration going on in the world that i i don't think we as the human uh species really tap into it you know there there's something that resonates and occasionally i think we we pick it up like a radio wave in in, uh, in little little increments, but I don't think we're always in tune to Go it. Go play now. <laughs> Katie, get her out of here. Sorry about that. <laughs> she likes to be annoying when I do podcasts once in a while. But, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's almost like there's something in the universe that wants us to know things and they want to tell us about it, but we just don't know how to communicate with them fully so they just show us the best they can yeah absolutely uh, i would i'm a hundred percent with that um and, and occasionally i think you know we get lucky you know uh, it's like a blind squirrel finding a nut every now and then you know we we manage to latch onto it and uh you know and then we lose it just as quickly exactly i mean i was driving to work a couple weeks a month, maybe a month ago now and well, drive. I usually I work from home, so I didn't usually drive go to work at, like in the field. But I usually like once a week I was, and I'm driving the hour and a half drive to the store I had to go to, and 
if I was five minutes earlier, I would have been involved in a huge seven to ten car like ice collision. Wow. Like, literally just seven or ten cars got all swerved in the ice at the same time and all kind of like created a domino reaction. And it's I could have been involved in it if I left my house five minutes earlier and if I didn't stop at Dunkin' Donuts. Like I could have been involved in it because I would have been up at that point in the road by then. I mean, it took me like three hours that it took me yeah, it actually took me like three hours. It took me like three hours instead of like an hour and a half to get to work that day because I had to go through so many back roads trying to find a way because I wasn't familiar with the state, let, let alone the local area, but the state I was in. So I had to use GPS and try to find back roads and it kept trying to get me a circle around back to that road. And it's just, it was hell. I almost died so many times that day going through like farmy roads that are mud and ice and it just, it's not fun. So, wow. I mean, I, I almost feel like that day, along with other days, because I drove a lot for this job. I just actually lost today. But I drove a lot for this job, and a lot of times there was just weird coincidences where, like, I would stop, decide out of the blue to stop and do something first, and then I would have avoided, I, I always end up avoiding, like, accidents or getting pulled over by a cop and getting a ticket or something like that. But that That's some Final Destination stuff right there. Oh, don't even get me started on when you're behind a freaking truck with a tree oh, in the back of it. Oh, no way. <laughs> I don't do it. I'll, I'll I'll pull over. Clearly, I've, people have never seen that movie. I know what happens. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I've, yeah, I literally have almost got into accidents trying to get around those trucks just because I want to get out, out from behind that truck. But, uh, but yeah. Well, so if you got a, uh, whew, a couple minutes, I'd like to tell you another story that happened to me that. Oh, you know, I, I, we definitely got the time. But yeah. let me ask you this first. Yeah. Those three girls that you did this with, did you ever find out like if like their family was more into that like type of stuff, like witchcraft or any of that type of stuff? You know, I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked that because about hmm, about six months ago, their mom passed away, so they were going they were having an estate sale over there, yeah. and uh, I hadn't seen them in years because I had moved to Florida, I'd come back, uh, I'd lived lived in other areas. Now I'm back again. I own the house where I grew up. So I'm right across the street from that house once again. So I went over to the estate sale and Samantha, Naomi, and Fiona were all there. And we got to talking. And I'm like, I'm like, do you remember that night with the Ouija board? And they're like, oh my God, we were so terrible. And I, so, you know, they didn't say they were messing with me. But I'm pretty sure they were just messing with me. Uh, but I said, uh, do you guys still have that Ouija board? They're like, hold on a second. They went into the basement. They came back and they gave it to me. So I owned the Ouija board that actually tormented me for decades. So uh, they weren't I mean, necessarily into a cult or anything like that. But, yeah. but I've got it. That's that's kind of a win, though. That's kind of like a I beat fate type thing, and I can display it. <laughs> I'm saying I think I would agree with you 100%. I don't open it up and play with it, but... Oh, I, I wouldn't dare. I've got, <laughs> but... I've got it sitting on the bookshelf. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically what I would do. I would display it, but I never would touch it, because it's just like... It's one of those things you don't want to mess with. I mean... It's like go. It's like going to Key West and taking Robert the doll out of his case and wanting to play with him. Like you just don't do it. No. Why? Why would I risk such a thing? Of no. course. Yeah. So, you know when? Uh, well, let me. You know when I was younger, at teenage going to twenty years, we used to like to do. They call it urbex now. You know, but there wasn't a name for it back then. We used to go to all these abandoned amusement parks abandoned hospitals and search through them and and drink beer and you know yeah of course do all kinds of stuff that boys do at the time um so let me give you a little bit of history uh in 1829 or 1826 construction began on the essex county asylum for the insane um this spot would be the location of the most terrifying thing that would ever happen to me. Um, it was called the Overbrook Hospital, and uh, the local residents just called it the bin. The 
sat on like 365 acres of land in Verona, New Jersey. There were tunnels that went underneath the place that connected the different buildings, and then they connected them to uh, cottages on the further reaches. The place was so massive, it had its own post office and fire department. And like from the very start of this thing, it was like a place of suffering. In the Great Depression, like homeless men and women filled the place to capacity and the staff did not have enough food to feed everybody. Uh, so many of them died. Then later after World War II, uh, shell shock soldiers returning from the war th filled it to capacity, over 3,000 of them. And the staff was just like ill-prepared to uh, yeah. handle it then again in 1917 during a record cold snap a series of boilers broke down and uh there was like reports of starvation frostbite and countless deaths during its lifetime over 10,000 people died under the care of the staff of the overbrook hospital by the time i found it in the 80s the place was abandoned Sometime between the 60s and 70s, they started closing down building after building. And the place was a wreck. You know, there was graffiti everywhere, broken glass, the gutters, the pipes, the wires had been ripped out. Of course. And, you know, despite all the stories, like we'd heard stories of hauntings in the place. We've heard stories that gangs were up there and they chased you around and they would beat the crap out of you. You know, we heard that a homeless people were up there and they tormented you while you were up there, you know, but none of that was enough to keep us out. In fact, it probably made us want to go up there even more. So, you know, being about 18 to 20 years old, me and three other friends went up there and it was late afternoon before sundown because we didn't want to be there in the dark. We did have flashlights. But uh, we're drinking beer, and we were probably smoking something, too. In fact, I know we were about to. And we're walking through the place. And the place was filled with, you know, gurneys were left there. Wheelchairs were left there. Files were still in the doctor's office. And the paint's peeling off the walls. And if anybody wants to look it up, you know, just go to the Overbrook Asylum. And that was in Essex County, New Jersey. There's hundreds of pictures of this place. And you'll, you'll feel like you're in a Freddy Krueger movie. So we get up to the second floor and it, it's getting dark, you know, um, and we're drinking beers, uh, bottled beer. So we're all going to walk into this one room. We look into the room and there's like an access into an attic and uh, it's a pretty big room. So we figure we're going to go in there. And we're we're going to get high in there. So all my friends walk into that room and I take my bottle of beer and I pull it back and finish it. And then I toss it down the hall. And I hear it clang and roll, but it never breaks. But I tossed it, you know, 20 or so feet down the hall. So we go in there and we start smoking. And all of a sudden, it's like really dark. Like within seconds, it's really dark. And it's feeling really cold. And we feel like, We've got to get out of there, like an urgent need to get out of this place. So we turn on our flashlights. Um, we are now pretty, pretty uh, inebriated, to say the least. And I'm the first one to exit the door, and I shine my flashlight down on the hallway. And standing right next to the door is my beer bottle turned upside down on its little rim with a puddle of beer around it balancing on the top of the beer and four grown men uh ran out of that place fast because I'm sure you know that there, there's only two possibilities of what occurred supernatural paranormal experience because we didn't hear anything. No one was walking around outside that door while we were in there. Or a person being really sneaky 
really wanting to mess with us. I don't know which is a scarier scenario, but uh, I mean, I I tend to think that if it was a person wanting to mess with you, they would have came and tried to take any of the beer or smoke you had. I would imagine. Yeah, I don't think it was a person. It doesn't seem like that. It definitely. <coughs> Sorry, still getting over being sick, but um, it seems like. Spirits like to do things like that, put things on end and make make just make things very weird for to mess with people. Like they want to make it seem they want to be noticed. At least some of them do, and that's why they do these type of things. It's just the way it goes. And that seems like something a spirit, a mischievous spirit would do. Well, I can tell you this. Um, if if any place on this planet deserves to be haunted. It certainly was the Overbrook Hospital. Um, so, yeah. much, so much pain happened there and suffering. And there's even if you go to the um, the pictures on the internet, there's there's writings from patients that were in there, like letters they were sending out. And some of these things are, are you can read them. They're they're frightfully disturbing. Um, yeah, I, I'm certain you know that it's been torn down since then and i believe there's condos up there now but uh that was the last time i went to the overbrook and i certainly would never never have considered going back there after that i mean well two things really um i mean a lot of mental hospitals from the 19 early 1900s till the 60s 70s were in that state and it was a horrible thing and they actually do a lot of them tend to be the most haunted places in america is all mental hospitals and i've heard of the overbook before you're sure it got turned down because i feel like i've heard of teams going there to investigate uh, you know they they filmed part of the movie choke there um the chuck poleniak book uh edward norton was in it most oh, I, yeah most of um there might be a couple of the buildings but yeah there's a lot of um there's a lot of pictures of them actually tearing down the overbrook uh, okay, I guess in 2017 they did. Yeah. 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 Okay, I guess. Yeah, I guess I did. maybe maybe I saw videos people posted of exploring it before then, but I guess yeah. possible. But yeah, man, it, it, there's a lot of videos up there too, and it you know there's a lot of stories of people who you know have experiences like that. Yeah, it's a. It's a man. Yeah, sound. I mean, I I at a band in mental hospital. It's not some place I ever would wanna. It's not my bucket list to explore. I'd rather go in the woods and look for Bigfoot than go to a book for spirits or a place like that. But yeah, you know, um, I'm gonna blame that on uh, bravado and and being young and you know being foolish. Definitely. Oh, I mean, when I was a teenager, before I got into before right, I was kind of like in my out of the paranormal phase before I got back into it again, like. I probably would have done it then if I if there was beer involved. Like, why not? Sure, because why at that not? at that age, at that age, it's just whatever. <laughs> let's go. If there's beer involved, I'll do anything almost. So let's go. But, yeah, it was the cool thing to do. So you know, um, actually, so the story of the Overbrook, a lot of what I just recited, and my experience is actually a short story now in one of uh, uh in my upcoming book that's coming out in on April twenty seventh. Short story titled "The Overbrook." Um, with some, um, this book's called Manxiety, uh, which is, it's a lot of stories based on supernatural things that have happened to me throughout my life. And then there's stories like the Overbrook, which are memoirs of some crazy stuff that happened word for word. So from, actually it's, it's funny because I tend to have a lot of guests that are from New Jersey with paranormal experience or with, or, I mean, I don't know if you heard of Eleanor, Eleanor Wagner. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sussex I, County hauntings. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. She's, I've had her on my show twice and I'm, I've been on her show and we got, we're, we're, we're friends at this point basically. And. Oh, wow. That's lot. so cool. And, uh, also we, um, East coast haunting, East coast haunted, I think. I forgot the hell they're called. They're going to kill me. But uh, there's another group of East Coast haunters based in New Jersey that I've had a couple of them on here as well. Like they're 
it's all everybody in New Jersey I talked to is always a good person. I mean, Mike Familant of uh, in search of Big Red Eye, he's mm-hmm. a big he, he searches for Big Red Eye, the big the New Jersey Bigfoot. Yeah. So. Yeah, we we've got that magazine Weird New Jersey. I don't know if you've uh, heard. Oh, I've heard of Weird New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, like when that first started coming out, you know, my friends and I were like, oh, yeah, let's go there. Let's go here. Let's go there. So, yeah, we we hunted them down and got in there and got in the thick of it. And sometimes for better and sometimes for worse, you know. Yeah, I mean, well, of course, if you're going to go searching legend tripping in paranormal places, it's going to either nothing's going to happen and it's all just elaborated or a hoax or... Or you're going to run into something you probably don't want to run into, and it hopefully it doesn't follow you home. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Which I've heard of that happening as well. So, did you guys, did you guys ever um, actually go bigfooting? Because I mean, bigfoot's been a big thing in New Jersey for as long as I can remember. Yeah, no, I, uh, you know, there's a lot of things in the woods up here um, that are weird, but I've never gone out there looking for something in the woods like that's uh i don't know i got asking for trouble i yeah i yeah so so there's a um there there's an abandoned it it was a place called jungle habitat and it was owned by warner brothers in the 70s and it was like a a drive-through safari oh and uh by six flags he, uh, it was no, it, it's in West Milford, New Jersey. Oh, okay, so we went there also, but I went there as a kid. Like my parents drove us through the safari, and they had tents and little rides there, and then this enclosure where the bears were. Um, I, I, me and one of my friends who actually went to the Overbrook went to Jungle Habitat in maybe like '99 or or somewhere right around there. And the place was, you know, abandoned. Now, the reason why the place closed down is the the company pulled out of there, like, overnight. Like, they went bankrupt overnight, and they left all the animals in there to die without being fed in their cages and in their enclosures. That's there were horrible. There were p- pictures in the, the paper, I remember, of the animals, you know, dead in their cages. So we went up there. And the first thing I noticed is like, there is not even a bird in the trees up there. It was so quiet and still. It was like nature knew something horrible had happened there. Yeah. So we're walking through it, and like the where the monkeys had been, there was bamboo that had now grown wild, and it was thirty to forty feet tall, huge bamboo, and the shower, the uh, bear enclosure. Uh, which was a giant pool, um, a flood had come through and, and washed it away. Now, just uh, a year or two ago, a bunch of guys went up there again, looking around, and they were attacked by a bear, and one of the guys got killed. Uh, and that's probably a lot of the reason why I am so afraid to go traipsing around for Bigfoot in the woods. Well, I mean, yeah, I I honestly would be more scared of a bear attacking me in the woods while I'm looking for Bigfoot than actual Bigfoot, but because, I mean, Bigfoots don't usually attack. I say usually because it's been known to happen, but it's a rare occurrence compared to usual right. when people are, people are out there sasquatching. Yeah, the bears are serious. Yeah, and I mean, plus, it's New Jersey. That's not even the creepiest thing in the woods. The creepiest thing in the woods is the Jersey Devil. Yeah, absolutely. That's a little. I think that's more South Jersey than uh, North. I'm in the northern part. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm from New York, so I know Jersey somewhat. I've been there for concerts and stuff, but besides that, it's always just been driving through Jersey to get south. Right. But I mean, yeah, the Jersey Devil is usually in the, is in the Pine Barrens, which is the south, if I believe. But right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. North Jersey is a lot more urban, if I'm not mistaken. Right. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you do have. You do have some very, uh, very wooded areas. Um, if you get very north and very west, you get closer to Pennsylvania and closer to New York, and then you've got yeah. really thick woods. 
Oh yeah, I mean, oh God, the woods of Pennsylvania are filled with so many things. I'm sure there's run over between the two states of what's in those woods. I mean, I've had uh, a Pennsylvania investigator on here who has had reports of dragons, dog men, and everything else coming out of those mines in Pennsylvania. So I'm sure they cross. I'm sure they cross the border in New Jersey too. I'm so, sure. And I mean, New Jersey is a for a small state. It has so much going on. Like that's the most amazing part because it's such a small state. But yeah, I no, mean, it, it really is packed, packed full of just about anything, any trouble you want to get into or anything you want to want to do, you can can find it in about an hour car ride, if, if that. I mean, plus it's the plus it gave us Kevin Smith, though, so you can't say it's all bad. <laughs> but you know, that's crazy that you say that because uh, I am going this saturday i'm uh, going to a horror uh show in south jersey in sayerville and while kevin smith is not going to be there brian o'halloran is going to be there dante mm -hmm. is going to be there yeah. uh, and we're going to be there selling books and there's going to be bands playing and uh we're uh down in sayerville on saturday it's going to be pretty cool i'm going to get my picture taken with dante for sure oh, that yeah See, I saw Kevin Smith and Jason Mewes when they did the Clerks. Uh, no, I mean, when they did the Jay Saw Bob reboot um, tour, I saw them live in Boston. And but there, I didn't buy the tickets to get like the private meet and greet and stuff because it was so ridiculously high. Like I just couldn't afford it at the time. But it's just I did I did get to see them live though. That's to me that's good enough. I mean, I'd love to meet Kevin Smith someday and get him on one of my podcasts and talk to him and whatnot. But that's a pipe dream. <laughs> Well, you never know. Might yeah, run, might run into him someday. It's possible. I mean, the day I start getting invited to podcast conventions, then maybe, but <laughs> or combo conventions, whatever. Either way, absolutely. Small steps. That's all. Exactly. Yeah. But let me ask you this: Have you ever? Because I mean, I know Jersey's big for this too. Have you ever had any experiences seeing UFOs of any types? I've seen things I don't know what they were. Um, yeah. But nothing where I'm like, oh, oh, that's definitely a UFO. Like, I remember seeing something during the daytime. And it was, uh, it was three separate objects. Very, very high. And this was before drones were out. You know, yeah. at, at least this was before drones were available commercially and there were three dots in the sky and they were hovering stationary in place in a triangle formation you know maybe a half a mile apart either way around and they kept moving uh like like rotating the triangle i have no idea what that was people are like oh yeah those those are weather balloons those are this i'm like those aren't balloons. Then, no way. Those are balloons. They're stationary. They're staying in one spot, and then they rotate in a perfect triangle. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what that was. So it was unidentified, and they were flying objects. So technically, a UFO. I mean, yeah, by all absolutely. I mean, well, I mean, when the government admits they're real now, then that pretty much says that anything in the air that we can't explain is, is, is a UFO by definition. So. At least that's my my how my mind works, but but yeah, let me I agree. Let me ask it the US though, since you're well, actually, okay, I want to make sure we have time for this. So you we talked about two of your books already. Is there any more we didn't talk about or well I have quite a few books out. Uh one, two, three. I've got five out. Well I see I own a publishing company, so I Yes. Yes, so I, I own a publishing company. I publish horror. It's called Last Waltz Publishing. And I started it when I, right after I got my first publishing contract on my first book, uh, I left that company and said, well, I, I could do this myself. <laughs> How difficult can it be? <laughs> Famous last word. Um, so I went on to publish uh, my second book and then my third. And then I took on a couple other authors. So now, you know, we're, we're Last Waltz Publishing has five authors and myself. And we're putting out more books each year. 
but yeah i i have quite a few and i have quite a few more coming out um throughout the year but uh, well, we, just, yeah go ahead well just generally speaking i don't want you to give too much away because you want people to buy the book obviously and read it but uh besides the two you talked about what are the other three about like generally speaking like yeah so my first book uh was called abigail is called abigail abigail is about a man who you know he he's he's ocd he's uh he's a little different than the normal guy and and he's been kind of mistreated his whole life so that's affected the way he uh looks at life um, one day he arrives home and there's a basket on his front steps and he opens up the basket and there's a baby in it and the baby has violet eyes scales on her face and horns and he actually looks at the baby and he thinks it's the most beautiful thing he's ever seen not realizing that it's probably a power that the baby has that's making him feel so withdrawn to it hmm. so he takes it upon himself to raise this child and everyone that abigail comes in contact with doesn't see her difference all they see is the most beautiful child they've ever seen and that escalates into uh a far stranger scenario and then you know you have to get the book if you really want to know what happens. oh yeah i mean yeah. so that sounds very uh almost up that almost up the alley of the omen or something like, something along those lines i i would say this is not like any horror story you've ever read and after reading it's only 50 pages long so it's a very short little novelette hmm. and uh and it surprised most people and actually abigail just hit 100 review uh, if i could only speak 100 reviews on amazon this past week so i'm very excited about that um i have other books too i i have a book called hacked in two where it's written by james carlson and myself he has a story in there that takes place in pennsylvania that has to do with the pennsylvania woods and a certain parasitic element that lives in the Par uh, pennsylvania woods my story in that book is called deacon which starts off in a post-apocalyptic zombie scenario where a man dressed as a priest or a deacon is going around vigilante taking care of the raiders and the uh the bad guys you know the guys who are out there stealing from everybody so deacon actually uh is the savior of this post-apocalyptic world and then that story actually jumps into the author who's writing the story so it's a crossover it's one of those stories with two stories in one oh, and the like those. one of the uh characters is named damon manx and damon's writing a book that He's really not comfortable writing and he starts uh starts digging up his own demons and having a very very trippy experience as he's writing the book one of my one of my favorite books that i i wrote hello jim thank you for watching hope you're enjoying it so far hey jim how's it going yeah well i mean that, that okay well both those books sound incredibly fascinating to me <laughs> I mean, as I'm a, I'm a, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm the, I'm not the biggest horror book fan, but I am a avid Stephen King reader and I do like my horror books and especially when they're done right. And these ones seem like they are done perfectly from what I'm hearing. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a constant reader myself. I am an avid King uh, fan. Mostly I tend to lean towards calling myself a dark tower uh, junkie uh the stand and 112263 you know these are the books that, that really got me my my most recent book that just came out came out in january that i wrote with mark Taus. he's a writer from australia and we have a story called our cranium uh our cranium 
takes place in the year 2032. The four horror authors are sitting around. They get together every month and have a couple drinks and talk about who's the best, who's doing better in sales, whose genre is scarier, and they can never decide on who's scarier or who's the best. And this friendship is very tried, and they're there's ribbing involved and they make fun of each other and it's a very love hate relationship. And they're like, well, I guess we'll never find out who's going to, who actually is the scariest because we'll all vote for ourselves. And then one of the authors said, well, there, there is a way there's a new technology called our cranium. It's artificial intelligence that plugs into the author's mind and it inhibits them. It allows them to come up with their greatest creation, their most scariest creation that they don't even know exists within them with the aid of this virtual reality. Not only that, it allows the other members of the group to come along and play the characters of the story. So they all go into our cranium and the stories come out one by one. There's four different genres of authors. You've got the old school sci-fi guy, you've got the extreme guy, there's an Asian horror writer, and then there's the gothic vampire lady. And as the gloves come off and they stop using the safe word, uh, things get a bit messy. And uh, that just came out. And the reviews have been really great for Our Cranium, written by Damon Manx and Mark Towns. It's really, uh, really a fun one. You can get all these, yeah. You can get all these books on Amazon. Um, Search Damon Manx, D A E M O N M A N X, or you could get them all at lastwaltzpublishing.com, my own website. You can go check that out www.lastwaltzpublishing.com. That's if you want a signed copy. They're also all available for Kindle Unlimited. So if you own the Kindle Unlimited, Go on to Amazon and get them for free. I swear, guy, I love Kindle Unlimited. It's one of the best things ever. Heck yeah, <laughs> so many Stephen King books I got to read for free. But it's awesome. But of course, all the all the amazing classic ones like The Stand, you don't get those for free. You got there for those. <laughs> it's short stories though and stuff like that. Yeah, you get them for free. But I mean, uh, all the had to shut up. What good amount of money you get all his classics? I mean, I started back in. Well, I, I, st- I got to Stephen King when I saw it, Chapter One, back in 2017, I think it was 2016. Remember the first one came out, and I started reading all his books. Started with Carrie, and I got. I am still on the second Dark Tower series book, and I just I moved in with my now wife and kids, and I haven't had time to read at all since then with podcasting and whatnot. But yeah, it gets so good too, um, you know, with uh, Drawing of the Three and then the Wastelands. Yeah. It just the more the the books get better as you go with that yeah power. yeah i know I, uh, one of my favorite bands that i brought on my music podcast uh demons and wizards they did a on on their first on their second cd they did three tracks in a row dedicated to dark tower oh and, wow uh the gunslinger all hail the crimson king and uh train of terror or terror train i forget what it's called but but they're all all three of them are in a row and they're all about the dark tower series they they take from a lot of fancy literature and stuff it's cool i love their it's heavy metal with literature in the background of it and lyrics i love it but uh, that's awesome that's cool yeah i i have a podcast friend who is a huge stephen king fan just like like me and he he loves dark tower series so when he came to my music show that's the album i brought forth because i want him to hear it because i'm like oh if you love dark tower you're gonna love these songs <laughs> Oh wow, that's cool. That that sounds really cool. It is. I mean, they're they're a good band. But so let me ask you this: in your future books, are you going to possibly be touching on paranormal elements in any way, or you know, uh, there are a lot of the short stories that I've written that have um, appeared in in uh, that are actually coming out in Manxiety have a lot of paranormal elements to it uh of course the the ghost 
situation thing. Um, qu- quite a few. There's there's one called the Devil's Well. Dad, in there. I don't let me play like I would be. Well, remember. Right, well, stop interrupting me, Jeremy. Let her play before you lose wood internet. Go, Bella. Go. You can't keep interrupting my shows. Go. What? Go. You can't keep interrupting. Go. How cute. Yeah, she's adorable, but she knows. Hi, Bella. Gonna wait five. Yeah, I touch on a lot of the paranormal, um, quite a bit. And actually, right now, I'm finishing up a, a four book series that hey. has uh, supernatural, paranormal elements to it. Quite a bit. Hmm. I love I love me a good series. I mean, there's yeah. something di- there's something different when you then when you're reading like a standalone book than when you're reading a series and you like you know there's more coming. Like it's just oof that feeling. Yeah, I have all four books, um, second or third draft, probably even fourth drafted, and I'm just working on the final edits of them. And sometime in 2024, the series will come out. Interesting. Definitely going definitely gonna to have to have you back on when they're coming out so you can talk about them a little bit. Yeah, I would love to. But um, let me ask you this, though. Living in New Jersey, do you believe in uh, whatever you, whether you want to call them lake monsters, ocean sea serpents, sea monsters, whatever you want to call them, do you believe in them living in New Jersey? You know, I, I'm a scuba diver. Well, and I haven't dove in, in years, um, but I, I believe there's things everywhere that we don't know about. You know, the, the ocean is the most unexplored part of this world. Uh, it goes much deeper than we'll ever be able to see. Mm. And there's things down there that, that we're finding out about all the time, so... Yeah, I mean, they're, to exactly. us, they are monsters, you know. But to them, they are. But to, to them, they're just creatures that were probably have been here since the dinosaurs or longer, and they just always have been there. I found in Florida on the uh, beach in Venice Beach a shark's tooth that's as big as the palm of my hand. Um, solid black. It's from a megalodon, and I figure if one tooth was the size of my hand the mouth had to be close to the size of my house probably yeah you know, which would make this shark the size of a football field maybe i don't know i i don't know proportions but it, a lot bigger than anything i've ever seen in the ocean oh and there is a lot of theory out there in the paranormal world that megalodon still exists i mean that movie the meg that movie the meg kind of helped with that but i mean there's, like you said, though, it's deeper than we'll ever know. And I truly believe there is a level down there where these creatures can still exist and feed. And that's why, I mean, that, that could explain some whale carcasses washing up at beaches here and there. Because what are sharks that big going to eat? Whales. And other megalodons, maybe. But mainly whales or maybe colossal squids as well, which we now know exist. So we know they have prey that's alive. So why couldn't they still be alive deep down where no one sees them? Yeah, you know, those uh, the first sailors out there on the wooden ships coming back with stories of sea monsters, you know, they they saw something, you know, whether yeah. it was was whales um, breaching the surface, but, you know, they knew about whales back then. Yeah, I mean, they used the oil for everything. Yeah, so they were seeing something, um, and... Like you said, you know, that Mariana's Trench is, is huge. Um, oh, God. It's yeah. so far deep. There's there's things we don't know about. I would be more interested in us fully exploring the ocean rather than going into outer space myself. I, I kind of have an equal interest in both because, I mean, one, I want to see, see what's... I want to see what's on... I want to see what's on the damn moon. That's my thing because... I am a huge believer that the moon landing did happen, but the moon is a hollow space station that was put there millennia ago by an alien species. It is not an actual asteroid or piece of Earth that broke off. I think that's just 
baloney. I think it's actually a hollow space station because when we shot a missile at it, it rang for 11 minutes. So, mm. I mean, I am, and so, something tells me that the guys, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, the guys who went to the moon originally, when they came back at that press conference the next day, they looked scared out of their minds of something. And it's either the government or it's whatever was on the moon or both. Yeah, there's a lot of reports of things that were seen on the moon by different uh, different um, astronauts. So, yeah, you know, I think I think within the next few years we're going to get to the truth about what's really going on out there. Out there. Yes, I am definitely looking forward to that. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate that. And according to Wild Bill, they saw the base on the dark side of the moon, which, I mean, that's where they would put it because then no one could see it from Earth, at least. But I I don't know. There's just there's something up there, and <laughs> who knows where they're from. I mean, I someone said to me that they think – another paranormal podcast recently said to me in a round here we were doing that they think that the government told us about UFOs during COVID to see how we'd react without getting too big a reaction because COVID was distracting us from the from that news story, which they were 100% right. It distracted a lot of people from it because a lot of people didn't hear it broke until months after it broke, even. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, that's a good strategy, you know, if you're going to break news like that because uh, still, to this day, you know, people aren't, oh my God, the government told us that there's UFOs, that this really exists, you know, it's really not it's not the internet buzz thing that you would think it would be. Um, no, it's, I mean, they, the Tic Tac videos that they, that, that the Navy released saying like, yep, here's proof of it. And I mean, it's just, it's insane that they finally admit it exists. And, but what's coming that they want to warn us about and they're trying to get us used to it first. Like that's my, that's my fear is what's coming that they know about that they want to try to get people ready for. I mean, is it an, are we getting invaded? Are we just going to be having more visitors soon than we've already had for the last millennia? Because you know, ancient aliens are a thing, supposedly. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, if they've leaked information out in small doses, I would think that they they would continue to do so. Oh and God, yeah. Until they build up to the point where they actually say, "Okay, well, here's the truth," you know. So it doesn't look like they've been lying this whole time for 60 years, you know, or who knows how long. Exactly. I mean, oh, exactly. Uh, While Bill says the moon is a satellite, it's not organic. Yep, that's basically what I was just saying. And they admit it because it can't be hidden any longer, which I agree. It, It really can't be. I mean, more and more people will tell you they've seen UFOs. More and more people will tell or start to come out and say, I've been abducted by aliens in my life at some point. I mean, you know, I, I read a book um, that that has to do with people who missing certain days of their life, and it occurs in national parks all over the United States. Yes. And, yeah, so you know what I'm talking about, right? Where these people have been, like, at one point, you know, at this location, and all of a sudden, days later, they wake up 100 miles away in some remote oh. part of the uh, park. And it all happens ju- in these national parks. And, you know, a lot of it alludes to uh, abductions of something taking place. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole missing 411 thing they have going on where all these people are disappearing up and down the East Coast, the West Coast, in the national parks, but also just in the wilderness, like it's hunters, it's trappers, it's people who spend a lot of time as outdoors men or outdoors women, and they're out there doing whatever they're going to do. And then all of a sudden they go missing, and a lot of them still haven't shown up. It's been a decade or years. And I mean, those ones I tend to allude more towards what's in those caves that we don't know about. Like, are they just getting attacked by dogmen and eaten? Or are, is it a Bigfoot thing? Is it interdimensional? Where they're they're going through a weak spot and they go through a different to a different dimension. Like I can't explain it. No one can. Mm. It's a big mystery. Yeah. The book I read, um, actually it's all the people who did go missing came back like a few days later 
with no recollection of where they had been or what had happened during that missing time. And they were all like hundreds of miles away from where they had gone missing. So like no explanation for what had happened. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, I just heard a story about that too. I think it was on the same round table I just mentioned, but about a man who went missing and then he showed up, he showed up a year and a half later, I think she said, like 400, 500 miles away from where he was originally. Like a different part of the United States, he showed up in completely. And he had no recollection that he'd been gone at all. He just kind of came to and was like, where am I? Like, I don't even know where I am. And there was only one set of footprints when they found where he was originally. Like when they went looking for him, there was only one set of footprints walking because he was at a beach somewhere and he was walking. He went to, he was down by the water and he started walking away from the water, but the footprints were going the opposite direction of where he needed to go to go home. And he has no recollection of why that happened, even. Right. Which, in my mind, is either that's supernatural or this guy has a secret family somewhere and he just was covering his own ass. But yeah, well, yeah, there's a possibility too. So. <laughs> I mean, it's happened before, but, and, yeah, I never heard of AB negative blood being the alien gene per se, but, but I mean, it's, there are star seeds out there in the world nowadays that claim they are, they have the spirits of aliens inside them or extraterrestrials inside them, and it gives them abilities like psychic or medium powers to a degree. So I've had enough of them in my show to know they exist. And I've seen what they can do. It's impressive. And yeah, they couldn't even drop them off where they picked them up. Damn lazy aliens. <laughs> but all right, well, yeah. Well, since we're, we are getting close to the end here, why don't you tell the audience one more time where they can find your books and where they can find everything about your publishing company? Yeah, absolutely. So naturally, you can any of the books that uh, I publish with my publishing company, you can get at Amazon. Uh, you can take a look at just punch in Damon Manx when you get to Amazon. D A E M O N M A N X. I have a publishing website that you could purchase any signed copies of the books. That's www.lastwaltzpublishing.com. Uh, if you get, head over to that website, join the mailing list. Uh, mailing list, we always send out uh, discounts and free books to all our subscribers. Uh, we have a list of other authors who also are assigned to the publishing company. So there's uh, not only just myself, but five other authors as well. You could get books from them. And you could also go to my own personal website, which is damonmanks.com. That's www.damonmanks.com. I'm on all the socials. You can look me up on Facebook. You can check me out on Instagram, Twitter, Damon Manx is the uh, the profile name on all of them. I'm also on TikTok and uh, just recently had like a, a video go semi-viral, I guess. You know, I, I'm close to 700,000 views on it. Um, and uh, subsequent parts of that have all gone up to about 100,000 views. So, you know, we could use any any more followers who want to go over to that crazy platform and, and join me there. I'm also telling the story of the Overbrook on there and uh, ha having fun with uh, a bunch, bunch of the stories that uh, have been my crazy life. Well, sounds amazing. And I, that's my dream right there to hit a real to have on my real estate that big. I've I've gotten up to like four thousand on one reel, but that's about as far as I've gotten so far. I'm trying to find that next big. Every every special show I do, I try to get reels out there. And now that I'm unemployed officially, I might start working out a little more. And because I'm already a professional, I'm already a professional on Facebook. So excellent. Uh, let me try. I'm gonna have to try to get out there a little more and promote my stuff a little bit more. But absolutely, that's how you do it. Practice makes perfect, right? Exactly, and we will. I will definitely post links as well to all your, to your company and to all your Amazon stuff on the description of the show when it comes out, so everybody can just copy and paste. Excellent. Hey, th thanks for having me tonight. I had a great time. My pleasure. And all my listeners, you know, you could find me on Facebook as Paranormal the New Normal slash Maniacal Music Musings Podcast with a S Facebook group. 
need to think of a better name for that. It's too long. But you can find me on Twitter and the gram as that juggalo bastard. You can find me on TikTok as that juggalo bastard podcast. And you can find me on YouTube just by searching Paranormal and Normal, where this is currently streaming as well. So you can find me there as well. And thank you, Charles. I'm glad you appreciated the show. And I will wish all my listeners a good night. And I will thank Damon one more time for coming on. And hopefully he'll be back in a year or so when his series starts coming out. Absolutely. I'd love to. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I will see, see my listeners in half a week. Have a good night, everybody.